to the Philip DeFranco show, the show that is the best show that's not really a show, but it's me talking to a camera. 15 to 24. Minutes, yeah. Yeah. What's up, you beautiful bastard? Hope you've had a fantastic Thursday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is in very interesting entertainment and business news, let's talk about Zendaya. And the reason for that is the news has now come out that she actually filmed a movie during quarantine, and this could actually be a big deal for the film industry. You know, since March, when lockdowns began, we saw productions on pretty much every film and TV show just shut down, leaving future and planned projects in this kind of wonky limbo. We started seeing headlines that Hollywood could actually be losing $20 $20 billion due to coronavirus delays. And with all of this, one of the many projects that had to stop was the filming of season two of Euphoria. Right, it's that fantastic show led by Zendaya on HBO. It left the cast, the crew with nothing to do or work on. So according to Deadline, one night during the quarantine, she calls up the show's creator, Sam Levinson, and asks him if he could write and direct a movie during quarantine. And just six days later, he churns out a script called Malcolm and Marie. He casts John David Washington as Zendaya's co-star. Shooting began on June 17th. It was completed as of July 2nd. The public then starts learning about this thanks to a report from Deadline as well as a photo from Zendaya posted yesterday from the film. And with all this, while there have been kind of rumors and rumblings about what this movie is, that, that's not the main interesting thing here. The interesting part here is how they managed to shoot an entire movie during coronavirus lockdown, right? Because there's been this big question for Hollywood of how do we actually get back to work? Especially because as of recording this video, we are seeing the number of coronavirus cases in the country continue to rise. So how do you do it while trying to remain safe? And so this movie may actually be the example. According to reports, they worked with doctors, lawyers, and film unions to make sure that they were meeting safety requirements. They found a location called the Caterpillar House in Monterey County, California, where, according to Deadline, it was legal to shoot on private property. And that house sat on 33 acres of land, which was important because it gave distance between the cast and the crew and the outside world, with the cast and crew going up to Monterey and then doing a two-week quarantine before shooting began. And reportedly, during those two weeks, everyone wore masks, social distance, had individual dwellings rehearsed in the parking lot, ate in designated spots with food only prepared by chefs who also quarantined, and no one was allowed off property. There were also several other rules as well, such as no more than one person in a room at a time unless people had been quarantining together, no food delivery, no physical contact. Cast and crew were also tested for the virus at the beginning and the end of quarantine. And also another major part of this was having a fairly small crew. Reportedly, no more than 12 people were allowed on a set at a time and the crew had to wear PPE before coming into contact with the actors. And there's more, uh, I'll link to it down below. It's all incredibly interesting. But you know, the situation is very much gonna be looked at as a test case. I mean, hell, according to The Hollywood Reporter, production last quarter fell by 97.8% compared to the same time last year. Right, it's almost a full stop. So obviously studios are gonna be doing everything possible to try to get back to filming. That's why you're seeing things on different projects. Announcements like Universal will be spending $5 million on COVID-19 safety. That to get Jurassic World Dominion back in production in the UK. But also, especially in the United States, you have a lot of people wondering, is that going to be possible because of these spikes? That's why you have people like Christopher Miller, a writer and producer behind things like Lego Movie and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse tweeting. There are a bunch of movies and shows that are hoping to start production soon, including some of ours, but they won't be able to go if the COVID numbers keep rising. So if you want fresh new content, please wear a damn mask and help stop the spread. But also because the spike in the United States is unique. We have Variety reporting that a number of projects are looking to relocate, but also depending on a number of factors per project, that can prove to be a challenging move as well. But ultimately, that's where we are with this. It is gonna be interesting to see what happens with the test case that is Malcolm and Marie. Does it become part of the new normal for Hollywood kind of kicking things back up? But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by nordvpn.com slash film. You know, whether you're working from home right now or you're taking advantage of those streaming services to decompress and escape the world for a little while, you are not alone. We've all increased our internet usage over these last few months. But if you're online without a VPN, you should probably fix that. And NordVPN makes it easy and affordable to protect you and your connected devices. And actually, not only do they provide security and privacy, they can also help keep you entertained. And that's because streaming services like Disney+, Plus. Amazon Prime, Netflix, they host different content libraries based on country. But with NordVPN, you can actually unlock those content libraries by just choosing a server in the country that has the show or the movie that you want. So you set it, boom, you get it. But main thing, to protect your devices and stream from anywhere today, head on over to nordvpn.com slash phil and use code phil to get 70% off a two year plan and an extra month for free. And the first bit of awesome today is we had Bill Nye spitting facts. Then we got an episode of Happier Hour featuring Hassan Minaj and Maitreyi Ramakrishnan. Then we got a teaser for the new Hulu series, Woke, featuring Lamore and Moore is easily one of the most underappreciated people on New Girl. Then, this is probably just for me, we got a dermatologist's entire routine from waking up to skincare. Then we had Billy Eichner's guest host monologue on Jimmy K. 
Kimmel Live. We got Eric Andre on Hot Ones. We got a peek at combat training for the old guard. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then it's been one of the themes of the week. Let's talk about the Supreme Court once again. And part of the reason we're talking about this today is the Supreme Court has dealt a massive blow to Donald Trump, ruling that he cannot block his tax records from being released to a grand jury, at least with his current defense. And that ruling came in not five to four, but actually seven to two, with both Trump appointees, Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh, siding with a majority, which we actually have a clip of that announcement. I don't think that was the right clip. But look, this is a massive deal. Trump's tax returns, what they contain, whether they could even be released. All of that has been at the center of a massive debate, really since Trump was even just a candidate running for office. With him winning, it also becoming one of the most anticipated and detailed rulings on presidential privilege in decades. So some background here for those who aren't familiar or maybe just forgot some of the important details. Today's ruling actually concerns two cases and both of them have different outcomes. So keep that in mind. The first of the two is a subpoena brought by Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr. And there, Vance is seeking 10 years of documents as part of a criminal investigation into potential state tax law violations by Trump prior to his presidency. Notably, that investigation includes looking into hush money paid to adult film star Stephanie Clifford, aka Stormy Daniels, during Trump's campaign run, and whether that hush money violated New York state law if it were filed as a false business record. And then the second case here was brought by three different House committees, with those committees subpoenaing a sweeping array of Trump's personal and business records, also prior to his time in the White House, including bank statements, engagement letters, personal checks, loan applications, and tax returns. And here, those committees have justified these subpoenas by arguing that the information in them is critical to drafting federal ethics and anti-corruption laws involving presidents. Right, and one of the big concerns here is whether Trump has business deals with Russia, which would be a major conflict of interest, and what some have argued would explain some of his actions, or at times inaction. Now, it is also important to note that Trump himself was never personally subpoenaed, with both Vance and these House committees actually sending those subpoenas to Trump's personal accounting firm, as well as three financial institutions used by him in his business. But nonetheless, we saw Trump filing lawsuits against both sets of subpoenas, trying to block those institutions from having to comply. Trump also also claiming while president that he had absolute immunity from being subpoenaed or being a subject of a criminal investigation. Also, with this situation, one of the things important to point out here is that Trump didn't just lose in the Supreme Court today. Right? This hasn't been a back and forth issue. He has lost in every single level of federal court all the way up to the Supreme Court. And notably, he's also the only president in modern history to not publicly release his tax returns or divest from major business interests while in office. Now, regarding this latest court decision, the Supreme Court actually heard oral arguments all the way back in May. And with both of these cases, it seemed like the justices were concerned about the potential for presidents to face harassment from subpoenas. However, they were also skeptical of Trump's absolute immunity claim, which actually today regarding that, we saw Chief Justice John Roberts writing in the majority opinion. 200 years ago, a great jurist of our court established that no citizen, not even the president, is categorically above the common duty to produce evidence when called upon in a criminal proceeding. We reaffirm that principle today and hold that the president is neither absolutely immune from state criminal subpoenas seeking his private papers, nor entitled to a heightened standard of need. But also, very notably, the justices didn't actually make a ruling on the case involving subpoenas from the House of Representatives. Instead, there, they said that neither side had put forward a compelling analysis of how to balance congressional subpoenas with a separation of powers, with them sending that case back to the lower courts for review. With Chief Justice Roberts writing, the House's approach would leave essentially no limit on the congressional power to subpoena the president's personal record. A limitless subpoena power could transform the established practice of the political branches and allow Congress to aggrandize itself at the president's expense. Right, so Roberts here is saying that the power for Congress to subpoena the president isn't off the table, but that the specific way in which the House wanted to go about doing so would essentially open up a power vacuum. Now, what I will say is following this ruling coming out, we, we got an unexpected reaction from Trump. He seemed actually very understanding. I'm kidding. Have you even been paying attention the last three and a half years? Trump went to Twitter throwing out some of his fan favorites. Presidential harassment, political witch hunt. Trump also saying courts in the past have given broad deference, but not me. The Supreme Court gives a delay ruling that they would never have given for another president. This is about prosecutorial misconduct. But on the other side of this, we saw Vance calling the ruling a tremendous victory for our nation's system of justice and its founding principle that no one, not even a president, is above the law. We've also since seen Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer issuing a statement saying, no matter how much he wishes it to be true, President Trump is not king. In a devastating blow to President Trump and his enablers in the Republican Party, the Supreme Court today upheld a fundamental tenet of our democracy that no one is above the law. Also responding to the House case being sent back to the lower courts, we saw House Speaker Nancy Pelosi say, Careful reading the Supreme Court ruling related to the president's financial records is not good news for President Trump. The court has reaffirmed the Congress's authority to conduct oversight on behalf of the American people as it asked for further information from Congress. Congress's constitutional responsibility to uncover the truth specifically related to the president 
president's Russia connection uh, that he is hiding. The Congress will continue to conduct oversight for the people, upholding the separation of powers that is the genius of our Constitution. We will continue to press our case in the lower courts. We also saw Deutsche Bank, one of the banks holding some of Trump's financial records, saying that it will abide by the US legal process and the final decision of the courts. But big thing here, if you're like, yes, I finally get to see Trump's tax return. Chances are no, you actually won't. At least not right now or as far as this ruling is concerned. Right, to be clear, this information would be meant for the grand jury's eyes. And since grand juries operate confidentially, documents there very rarely leak. Though I will say anything's possible. We live in unprecedented, especially leaky times. I also think had the House received those documents, very likely that would have gotten out to the public, which on the note of that possibility, right now it's been pretty much all but guaranteed that the House will not be able to get Trump's records ahead of the election. Though to jump back, it's also not known when exactly these documents would be handed over to the grand jury, especially because as SCOTUS noted, Trump can still fight the release by raising defenses other than absolute immunity. Which I, I will say with the Supreme Court, it feels like more and more a lot of their decisions involve, you can't do that, but maybe for a different reason, right? And so regarding that possibility, you have Axios saying that his lawyers will now just have to use the same arguments that they would use for a client who is not the president. That's also why we've now seen White House Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany spinning this as a win for Trump. Right, this decision by the Supreme Court only states that the president is not immune to being subpoenaed, but it doesn't stop him from challenging the specifics of each of these cases. So with all of that said, you know, it's important to remember that today overall is a loss for Trump. He is still able to buy time. Now, with all of that said, it will be very interesting to see what updates we get here. Also, I do want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts about the Supreme Court decision here? Even if we don't get to see those tax records, are you happy to see that absolute immunity for a president is getting knocked down? Does it make you feel like there's almost checks and balances like we were told when we were growing up. But while you maybe answer that though, the last thing that I wanna to touch on is something else that the Supreme Court did today. So over a year ago, back in January of 2019, we put out a video called How a Horrific Murder in Oklahoma Might Turn Half the State into an Indian Reservation. Right? And we were like, this case might be a big deal one day and it's making its way to the Supreme Court. So we're keeping an eye out for it. Well, it eventually got deadlocked four to four after Gorsuch had to recuse himself from the case. But in the meantime, Migrit v. Oklahoma made its way to the court and had similar circumstances that would decide the fate of both cases. And boom. Here it is. Today, in a five to four ruling, the Supreme Court ruled that nearly half of Oklahoma is a Native American reservation in the eyes of the criminal justice system. With the New York Times calling it potentially one of the most consequential legal victories for Native Americans in decades, and noting that it could have far reaching implications for the 1.8 million people who live across what is now deemed Indian country. And the lands included in this conversation include much of Tulsa, which is Oklahoma's second biggest city. And as far as who was the conservative justice that joined the liberal justices in this five four decision, it was not John Roberts, but rather Trump appointed Neil Gorsuch, with Gorsuch writing, Today we are asked whether the land these treaties promised remains an Indian reservation for purposes of federal criminal law. Because Congress has not said otherwise, we hold the government to its word. Now on the other side of the Supreme Court, in the dissenting opinion, we saw Justice John Roberts write, The state's ability to prosecute serious crimes will be hobbled and decades of past convictions could well be thrown out. The decision today creates significant uncertainty for the state's continuing authority over any area that touches Indian affairs, ranging from zoning and taxation to family and environmental law. But yeah, I mean, this ruling is massive for a number of reasons, including that it prevents the state from being able to prosecute offenses in the Creek Nation Reservation that involve Native Americans. Though, notably, that does not stop federal authorities. Also, I mean, as far as other impacts we might see, we saw Republican Senator James Lankford issuing a statement saying that he looked forward to working with the five tribes affected by the ruling to craft legislation that ensures that the ruling has a minimal impact on individuals and businesses throughout Oklahoma. With Republican Senator Jim Inhofe saying that moving forward, the focus will be working with tribal and state officials to, quote, find a workable solution for every one that ensures criminals are prosecuted and brought to justice in the most appropriate manner. But yeah, for now we have to wait to see what happens in the state. But Gorsuch did appear optimistic in his opinion, writing that Oklahoma and its tribes have proven they can work successfully together as partners. Right, with people also noting that the case didn't change any ownership of land, it doesn't change the prosecution of non-Native Americans. It's a very specific thing, but we're gonna have to wait to see what this all actually looks like. Also, if you wanna know how we got to this point, like I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna link to when we talked about this last year back in January. But yeah, that's where this one ends, and of course I'd love to know your thoughts on it. And the last thing, we're gonna talk about today, I've seen people requesting this. Let's talk about the heartbreaking news around Naya Rivera. She's a 33 year old actress best known for her role on Glee. And the reports coming in right now as we're filming is that she is missing and she is presumed dead. According to reports, Naya took her four year old toddler out on a boat in Lake Piru yesterday afternoon. And about three hours after they left the dock, someone else on another boat noticed this, this boat kind of just drifting. And upon inspection, finding the, the four year old uh, alone, sleeping in a life vest. With reports also going on to say, an adult sized life 
jacket presumed to have been Rivera's was discovered on the boat. Her identification was also on board and her car was found nearby. According to authorities, the four-year-old is in good health. Also, he reportedly told investigators that his mother was swimming but did not come back up to the boat. Also, according to Ventura County Sheriff's Department Captain Eric Bouchchow, there's no evidence of foul play. Also adding, this may well be a case of drowning. And as far as where we are with this right now, the, the authorities have said this is a search and recovery effort, with some reports claiming that she went missing in water with only five to nine inches of visibility, with authorities saying the lake is filled with trees and debris on the bottom. And right now, according to the Ventura County Sheriff, there are more than 80 people involved in the search. But that is ultimately where I'm gonna end this story for now until we know more information. We're seeing a lot of theories and conjecture popping up. I, I do not wanna add to that. So where I'll end this story is just to say that my, my heart and, and my thoughts go out to Naya's loved ones, her friends, her family, her fans. It's just a, a totally unexpected and horrible situation. And it's what feels like almost a daily reminder when we, we look to the news of just love who you have while you have them. You never know what's gonna happen. A lot of things in this world are, are, are far more fragile than we we think, actually, I think we know. We try to distract ourselves with the millions of things that we can put in front of our face, but it, it's always there in the kind of the back of our head. I don't know, that's that's where I'm gonna end this story. And that heartbreaking and somber note is actually where I'm going to end today's show. Though, you know, if, if there is something that I can tag onto this, when, when I say love who you have while you have them, of course, the, the main thing that I'm thinking of is your, your family, your friends, stuff like that. But I, you know what, I actually wanna extend that to you watching right now. Thank you for being a part of this. You make me feel less alone in this crazy world. And, and you believe, a lot of you believe in me more than I believe in me. And I'm saying that to you. If if you're one of the three people still here watching at the very end of the video. You're who I make this show for. But with that said, thanks for watching. I love your face and I'll see you next time. I hope you liked the video. Subscribe if you like it.